Welcome to the PharmaSource podcast. Today's episode is a bit of an exclusive. I'm Luke Bilton, and today I'm interviewing David Berman, Vice President of Finnish Goods Procurement at Bayer, about a significant shakeup of their global contract manufacturing network. As you'll hear, around half of Bayer's global sales are delivered by their network of around 200 contract manufacturers, and they've just launched an RFP to reduce their number of partners significantly. It's a fascinating example of supplier consolidation at scale. This interview is a preview of David's talk at CDMO Life, where he'll be going into much more detail on the project with his colleague Malik Akhtar, a previous guest on the PharmaSource podcast. So if what you hear is of interest, make sure you head to pharmasource.global slash CDMO Life and register for your free ticket. Before we get to the interview, here's a quick message from our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific. The PharmaSource podcast is sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher Scientific provides industry-leading pharma services for drug development, clinical trial logistics, commercial manufacturing, and clinical research. They partner with customers in the pharmaceutical, biotech, and life sciences industries as their trusted CDMO to deliver medicine to patients faster. On with the interview. David, thank you for joining me on the PharmaSource podcast today. Great to see you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. To start with then, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about your experience in Bayer itself and in joining the industry. Tell us about your background, please, David. I haven't been in the pharma or the, the consumer health industry for very long, so I'm going on two years now. But I did join uh, Bayer as a company 13 years ago, and back then I started in the, the in-house consulting team. So basically managing um, strategic projects across different functions and b- business units. And that's sort of how, how I started my career. What type of projects would they have been? It was mainly in the supply chain area. And Mm -hmm. actually, one of my first projects was uh, on spend optimization. So that was also my first real touch point um, with with procurement. Uh, Before that, I didn't really know what what procurement people did. Um, Mm -hmm. But I really enjoyed it. Um, I liked the the work that I did there. So that's also why I decided to move into um, the role of a procurement professional. So... I then sort of transitioned from consulting into, into the indirect world of procurement and was a, a category lead for external management consulting. So I could sort of combine my experience as a consultant with the, the, the functional know-how, know-how I learned on some of those projects. And so McKinsey, um, BCG, and Bain were my key accounts for that period of time. Um, I then also spent some time on a post-merger integration in the, in the ag space, uh, representing procurement. I, I, I guess you can imagine which, which merger that was. Mm-hmm. Um, and on top of that, I, I was involved in a uh, sort of in the design team to transform the operating model in procurement, where we outsourced um, parts of the, the procurement um, activities to an external provider. After okay. that, after that piece, I then moved into, uh, into the direct area of procurement. So uh, moved into, into crop science, where I led a team responsible for managing tolling, third-party actives, and finished goods. Um, did that for roughly uh, three years, and then moved into my current role in consumer health, where I look after, um, or my team looks after, the, uh, the CMO relationships that we have. That acquisition, I mean, obviously, it's happened several years ago, so I'm sure we can talk about it now. Yeah. I'm guessing that's Monsanto. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that was a very big merger. The biggest in Bayer's history, I believe, at yeah. the time. Yes, it's, it's huge. And also two companies with very proud legacies uh, coming together, which uh, created its challenges, but also uh, lots of opportunities for, for the business. That must have been fascinating. What was your role within that huge acquisition? Yeah, so, so back then I was uh, representing the uh, enabling functions piece. So all the let's say the, the procurement areas that go across the different divisions to, uh, to represent them in the PMI project. And basically what we did, we, we went after synergies. We looked at um, opportunities where we can you know, com- combine our volumes, um, leverage better contract conditions, um, and so on. The other piece was um, designing the, the new org, combining the two companies. Fantastic. And so now, as you say, you're, you're now responsible for contract manufacturing on the procurement side. How have you found that transition? Because many people, when they're working in procurement at senior roles in that sort of space, often they've got a background in chemistry or biotechnology, whereas yours is much more from the business side with your master's in finance and MBA in business administration. So 
How have you found learning your small molecules from your large molecules? How have you found that? Yeah, so I mean, the, if, you, if you think about a learning curve, it's been very steep since, I, mm. since I've joined. And it, it still feels like I'm, I'm learning every day. So it, it's like I learn new things you know, on the job every, every, every day, basically. Especially in the CMO space, I think the breadth of what you know, procurement people get encountered with is just very, very big. And I think also the, within the pandemic times, we suddenly learned a whole lot about our resilience and you know, how quickly things can change. Mm. So in terms of industry and also products and also brands, because I wasn't accustomed to our, our brands, that was definitely a huge uh, a learning that I, that I did over the past um, two years. When it comes to it more the procurement skills, I think they're very much transferable from yep. one area to the other, right? So, I mean, I moved from indirects to directs in crop, now to directs in, uh, in uh, consumer health. So I think they're, they're very transferable. And the way I look at it is, I mean, procurement will never be the expert on innovation. We won't be the expert on you know, engineering or, or technologies or on R&D or, or sustainability. But I think the value add that, that, that comes from procurement is sort of connecting the dots and tapping into those resource pools within the company um, mm. and infuse that then into our you know, uh, sourcing strategies, supplier relationship management, um, and category strategies. We're about a quarter of the way through 2024. How have you found it so far? I mean, are there any particular challenges in this year that you're facing versus the years before? What's top of your to-do list at the moment? I think one of the one of the main challenges that we've had, and I'm looking back a bit, so over the past two years was was the change in priorities. Mm. Right. So when I started, um, and that was sort of right um, in the in the aftermath of the pandemic. Basically, then you know. The, the priorities were get material at, at whatever cost, right? It was just mm-hmm. get get supply, get supply. That was our main objective. And that then quickly transitioned into, well, let's look at costs. Mm-hmm. And that transitioned into, ooh, cash is also important. We have to right-size our inventories that were built up as a post-pandemic effect. So sort of the, the transition, a very rapid transition of priorities has really shaped sort of the past, um, the past two years. Um, the way forward-looking and, and the way our targets are structured, we basically have these four Cs within procurement. It's cost, cash, carbon, and community. Mm-hmm. And those four Cs, um, you know, they, they trickle down um, into, into all of the teams in procurement. And then we're sort of at the, at the, at the place where we work um, and um, combine that with the targets of our stakeholders, uh, in business or in product supply, that's sort of where we balance those objectives and and make sure that everything's aligned. Mm. But those four C's sort of direct our priorities going forward. How do you strike the right balance between them? Because particularly if you're thinking about decarbonization, that objective can sometimes be in conflict with cost management, for example. How do you tend to sort of prioritize those different objectives? That's a tricky, tricky question. Because mm-hmm. in the end, all of those things are very, very relevant and important for us to run the business, right? So what we've what we've started doing um, is implementing these even over principles okay. that allows us to say, you know, sustainability even over cost or even over cash. Mm-hmm. And those can be adapted depending on the, the business case we're running or the certain situation we're in. But those even over rules really make it clear what we want to go after. Um, in in, in some of our projects or initiatives. Okay, that's interesting. At CDMO Live, you and your colleague Malik Akhtar, you'll both be presenting your new strategy um, for how you're optimizing Bayer's contract manufacturing network going forwards. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that, please, about what what is it, that what is that project, and whatever you can share about the size of the network now, where you're looking to take it to as you're consolidating and the kind of factors that you're taking into account as part of that project. If you could just give us a bit of an overview ahead of your session at CDMO Live, that'd be great. No, absolutely. So maybe maybe first starting with a bit of background. So mm. Bayer relies heavily on uh, CDMOs. They're an integral part of our, um, our overall supply chain. And um, we need the best companies um, to ensure that we can fulfill our mission, which is helping you know, over 1 billion people live healthier lives with the most trusted health uh, self-care solutions in the market. Hmm. And that's a pretty bold objective. So we really need the best partners and every piece of the entire supply chain to be focused on that, to deliver against it. And that includes the, the CMO network. 
what we what we see that over the past the the network has somewhat organically grown. You know, it's gotten bigger. You know, we added a CMO here, added one here, for for good reasons. Um, but that led to a situation where we now have um, shy of two hundred uh, CMO partners. Mm. Um, you know, and they, they account for roughly half of the revenue that Bayer generates. So they're you know large portion of the of the overall business. And based on on that background, sort of Project Martini was born. Okay, and actually, you're wondering about the name probably, but so a lot of our uh, initiatives within the product supply world have James Bond themed names okay. right now, <laughs> and and we chose Martini, you know, based on the on the phrase uh, "shaken, not stirred," because mm. we want to shake up our current network, and we wanted to make that uh, you know uh, prominent with with that with that name. The approach that we're taking is is a bit different. So so Martini has become within the company pretty. Um, visible project. So it's sponsored by our COO and CFO. And the approach that we're taking here is to go to market with a fairly large portion of our external, uh, externally produced produced volumes. Hmm. It's a large scale tender that covers several technologies and basically all regions. Um, and within that, within that tender design, we've included roughly uh, one fifth of our overall sales. So it's, it's, a, it's a very important project and it's, basically designed to test the strategic fit um, operationally and commercially of our um, of our suppliers. Very interesting. And are there, there must be some particular technologies and capabilities that you're, that you're looking for as part of that large scale tender? So basically it covers, I mean, it covers a, a very, very wide range of te- technologies. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't be able to say that we're excluding something specifically. I mean, you know, we have a set of technologies that um, we consider as our let's say, core technologies, and those we mainly try to produce in our own network and mm-hmm. want to become the best-in-class production um, company for those technologies. Nevertheless, we still need uh, CMOs to also chip in as uh, resilience or as a, uh, to, serve a, to serve a special market for those technologies. And then we have a huge array of other technologies where we rely solely on, on CMOs. So I would say it's it's more technology agnostic at this point, um, and it covers all technologies and, and and regions. From that, I'd assume all technologies, all regions. I'd assume you'd be looking for a fairly significant player, ra- rather than a collection of smaller niche players. Ideally, one large partner. Exactly. I mean, one of the, the success factors of Project Martini will be to um, to come out with a with a leaner and more consolidated network. Mm. So partners that can serve a wide range of technologies, but also that sort of have capabilities, innovation to ensure that they will be future proof, um, you know, play, play a, an important role in this, uh, in this tender. Very interesting. 2024 has been a very interesting year in the CDMO space with some very big moves like Novo sweeping in on, on Catalan, for example, in the US, the new Biosecure Act targeting Chinese companies, the likes of Wuxi, for example. From your perspective, I mean, how, how do those sorts of considerations play into your thinking? When you're looking for a, a long-term strategic partner, how are you thinking about trying to find someone who can be a proper partner that you can rely on for not just for the next year or two, but for decades? I think within the, within the CMO space, you always have to look into mid or long term. You, you don't do short-term deals simply because the cost of moving production is prohibitive. So you have to think about partners that, that you can work together with for um, in, in the middle or long term. Are there ways to structure a partnership which would encourage that? So to move beyond transactional, yeah. but to find diff- different ways to really embed yourselves within each other's organizations. One aspect is the willingness to, to collaborate. Mm. Right? It's difficult sometimes to, to test that up front. But I think you know, in, a, in a true partnership, transparency is really important. What level of transparency is a CMO willing to to share and what level are we willing to share, mm-hmm. right? So going that one step, one step deeper to then truly help uh, one another and, and drive win-win solutions is really important. But as I said, sometimes it's difficult to assess that up front. I think that's also where soft factors come in, right? In the end, it's still a people business. Otherwise, you know, it would be computers making, making all the decisions and, uh, and, and building the proper scenarios. So having good face-to-face conversations up front, mm. for me personally, is really important. Yeah, very much looking forward to hearing more about it on the 13th of June, when I guess you'll be a bit further down the line as well and have more that you can share in your talk. 
Absolutely. So with a project of of that magnitude, there must be, before you're ready to go to market, before you're ready to announce it to partners, there must have been a lot of work internally across your business. I'm just interested in how would you collaborate with those other business functions to bring them along with you and make sure that they feel like they're part of it? My assumption would be that lots of people within the organization would have their own ideas or partnerships which they value and may not want it all to be swallowed up into a big a big RFP. How do you work across the business in that sort of situation? Yeah, I think one of the benefits of Martini is that it fits nicely into the overall product supply objectives, right? Mm. So making the network leaner, um, more consolidated is one of the core priorities also of our COO. So there, we didn't have to do much convincing mm-hmm. um, to get uh, to get that piece of the organization on board, um, and that that helps tremendously, right? So having that senior sponsor sponsorship um, is is really important to us. Also, it it enables us to um, to um, unlock some funds. Mm. So uh, to to actually do the project uh, properly, we had to invest in a sourcing platform. Our current RFQ capabilities and sort of the technology behind it won't allow for everything that we want to do uh, within Project Martini, such as you know scenario building, expressive bidding, mm-hmm. allowing for alternative bids. So we had to also invest into um, into a platform and a partner who can um, can support that initiative. So having that buy in is um, was crucial. Um, we will have a lot of trade off dis- discussions once we see the results of mm. the tender, um, and I think that's when. Um, is there also some some more challenging um, comments or opinions will will come up, but then we have the fact base to argue uh, for or against something. And um, without that fact base, we can't really have those discussions properly. So I think that will that will really be good and and lead to a discussion where, and we can objectively make make good decisions. Whether everybody likes them, I don't know. Um, but at least we'll have a fact base to support um, that decision making process. What does good collaboration across the business look like? For you, I mean, if, if you think back in terms of your career at some good examples of that, when does it really work successfully? It only works successfully if there's a pull for procurement to be on board. Mm. If, like, I think historically procurement has often played sort of this compliance type of role, right? There were a lot of rules and policies within a company that procurement had to be involved at this stage gate or, you know, it couldn't progress without a procurement signature at this point. Mm. Um, and I think we're moving away from that or have moved away from that. So there, there needs to be a pull for procurement to be part of a project or an, 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 mm-hmm. an initiative. Um, otherwise, it's, it's, it, it, procurement can't deliver value. And the only way um, we're being pulled in if we do a good job. So if, if procurement does what procurement does well, we will be wanted and needed on these on these projects without a rule or a policy um, telling a stakeholder that procurement needs to be included. Great. On the sourcing platform, do you mind me asking who you're using for that technology? It's Cooper. Ah, uh, great. You didn't have an RFP tool before. We do have an RFP tool. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have the capabilities um, of what Cooper offers with their sourcing platform. Yeah. And basically, we ran offline tenders, um, especially in the CMO space. You know, we we haven't done anything at this scale. And also, typically, it's not done at this scale in in the CMO business. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's it's going to be somewhat of a of a new approach. Yeah, and so training your teams as well, I guess, on how to implement Cooper and embed it into your processes. So the way we're we're looking at it right now is a one off mm. um, with a managed service. So we won't become the let's say the Cooper experts as part of this project mm. um, because we will have um, a sourcing team or a, an expert team of Coopers to support us during the during the tender. Um, that doesn't mean we won't be open to working with Coopa um, on other say, categories or projects going forward. Great. Okay. Really interesting pilot, won't it, to see how it delivers for you? Yeah, me too. So I guess in a, uh, at year's end, we'll be able to uh, give some more insights. Okay. Great. And then we touched on it earlier, but the industry is, contract manufacturing space is consolidating and investing and changing and growing and how are you thinking about managing risk in that context and over-reliance on a supplier while still achieving efficiency gains? How, how do you put safeguards in place so you don't put all your eggs into, into one basket, particularly at a time when you want to consolidate? 
the way we do it is we identify certain products or formulations where we want to have two sources. Mm. Those are our, our most important uh, products. And there we, we operate with a, with a parent-child concept. So we have one right. parent site that produces you know, a, a, a good portion of that volume and then a, a child site, which produces the rest. And we would then be able to flexibly switch between those two, those two sites. And they can be both internally or externally. So a CMO can do the child portion, but they can also do the parent portion. Another CMO do the child portion. So it doesn't really matter where it's produced, but we want to make sure that we have those, um, those dual sourcing in place. Mm-hmm. The, other, the other piece on resiliency um, is in raw materials. So a learning also from the pandemic is to um, work together with our CMOs to ensure that they have dual sourcing on some of the key raw material needs. And that's also an effort that's been that's been going on for quite some yeah, time. Yeah. David, thank you so much. Really interesting. Um, and as I say, looking looking forward very much to your talk at CDMO Live. Just before we finish up, I wonder if you could just if you take a step back a bit, what motivates you? What do you find keeps you going and gets you out of bed in the morning? What keeps me out of bed is my daughter. Yeah. How old is she? She's two years old. Great. So she's uh, she's super wonderful, but also very active and uh, requires a lot of attention. <laughs> no, but I think what drives me and motivates is the people around me. So I have a fantastic team of talented people, and they do great work, uh, which also allows me then to focus more on you know, strategic projects or also leadership activities. Mm. And that's where I really get my energy out of. So you know, you, you won't see me optimizing processes in, in, in our systems. That's not something that I really enjoy doing, um, but it's really working together with people, unlocking and developing talent, having strategic discussions with our with our CMOs um, and our supply base. That's what, um, what motivates me. David, thank you so much for joining us. Luke, thanks for having me. Pleasure. Thank you to David Berman, who will be speaking about Project Martini at CDMO Live in June. Make sure to claim your free ticket by heading to pharmasource.global slash CDMO Live and sign up. And thank you to our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific.